I was the commander of Area 51. I would lie and say I never worked out there. It's the most famous secret military base in the world. We did accept these conditions. Keep your mouth shut. Your lives or other lives depend on it. Now, the men who worked at Area 51 tell their stories for the first time. There's been an awful lot of misinformation, but it's been fed by people's natural curiosity. If you don't know what's going on, you might like to find out. The agency has never and will never ever admit there is an Area 51 in the story. Established by the CIA in 1955 to develop and test America's most secret military projects, Area 51 was named after a grid number on a map. While officially it doesn't exist, Today, satellite images of the Nevada desert show seven runways and more than 25 hangars. Shrouded in secrecy, access has always been highly restricted. But finally, the early programs that started it all are being declassified, and memories can be brought to light. It was a real Cold War. You're talking nuclear bombs aimed at every major city. And it's like two people, who's going to throw the first punch? There are a lot of times when democracy just has to give way to strict control, like military, so you can accomplish something that will allow for your country to survive. And that's the way we all thought about it, I think. We had a meeting. No pencil or paper was allowed. Even the pilots did not talk to each other because nothing was written down. It's all in our, in our heads. When we came into the program, we were given a code name. My first name was Ken, and the last name started with C for Collins, but it was uh, Colmar, C-O-L-M-A-R. At least with me, I'm not that curious which I felt was good on the secrecy part of it. I mean, if I don't need to know it, I'm not going to ask. I was told, don't bother ever trying to find your level of clearance. You've just been cleared by the highest groups in Washington, D.C. They have an apparatus to know what you're doing, what you're saying, where you're going. The base was built around a dry lake bed known as Groom Lake. It offered obvious advantages. Well, we needed a good place to land that we could land any direction, depending on where the wind came from, and the round lake served that purpose. It was also protected with the mountain rains around it, so it wasn't very visible. Smooth as glass. Just unbelievable. I could take that staff car out there as fast as it'd go, and it wouldn't even make a bump. It was just beautiful. Groom Lake was very sparse, very sparse. We had a bunch of trailers for us to live in. And we had a all-purpose building where you eat, didn't have TV, didn't even have a radio. We didn't have any women there. There was one woman who was with the finance of CIA that came up there and spent one night. That's the only one I ever knew of. Well, Paradise Ranch was the 
first name that was given to the establishment. They thought it would soften the blow of the austerity. It was an attempt to perhaps convince people it wasn't as, quite as bad as it looked. I think the charm of Area 51 is it just had one job to do. And anybody that wasn't needed didn't go there, probably didn't want to go there, because you know it wasn't that grand a, a vacation spot. Pretty, pretty tough duty. The CIA needed a certain kind of man to work at Area 51. But we kind of self-selected to be uh, quiet warriors. The security screening tended to eliminate a fair number of people who were uh, kind of show-offs. I was in for my first secrecy clearance, and I went to a movie while my wife went shopping with my mother. I'm in the middle of the movie. In walks this lady, young girl, about my age. And in the middle of the movie, asked me if I live in Vegas, how long I've been in Vegas, and what do I do? She didn't like my answers. Within a half an hour, she got up and left. And I often thought, how long had she been following me? Or was she following me, or was she just one of the Las Vegas girls <laughs> looking for a customer? I, I'll never know. We were not told what it was going to be. We had no idea. We were just told it, it's extremely sensitive and it's not to be discussed with anybody. Interviews were conducted in hotel rooms. This guy had passed everything. So then they asked him, we got a black project back west we'd like for you to work on. Would you be interested? And you asked, well, I need to run that by my wife. They said, OK, do that. When he got back to the motel room, they were gone. They packed up and left. He never saw them again. The fact that he had to ask his wife whether or not he could work on a secret project killed him right there. He, he was not invited back. Area 51 was created for one top secret project called Aquatone. In 1955, men from the CIA, the Air Force, and a secret division of Lockheed came to Paradise Ranch to begin work. All they would tell us, you really were going to volunteer for a pig and a poke. And most of the people didn't take it, but I did. And uh, we knew we had to uh, go for pressure suit, so we knew it was going to be high altitude stuff. Your blood boils above 50,000 without having pressurization. So if you were to lose pressurization, just your engine conk out and you're above 50, that suit saves you. They selected a manufacturer in Boston that made the suits up to order. They had to be tailor-made. Uh, skin tight. So we went to David Clark, who made brassieres for Sears, I remember. We were fitted, came home, and we went back and fitted again after it was made. And couldn't tell them, you know, who we were or what we were doing. Just, we need a pressure suit. <laughs> when pilots fly higher than man has ever flown, Equipment changes are necessary. In this recently declassified footage, Ray Gowdy prepares for a flight inside Area 51. The modified MA-2 partial pressure suits are personally fitted for each pilot. A loss of only two pounds in the pilot's weight could make the suit ineffective, or a gain of two pounds would make it almost impossible to get into. The men looked like nothing seen on Earth. And rumors about what was going on inside Area 51 started to swirl. It was so secret, I didn't know what it was until I 
got there and uh, wondered what I got myself into. <laughs> People on the project didn't know everything. You know, the mechanics, for instance, didn't know what we were doing in the air. <laughs> that's, that's how secret it was. We don't keep anything out. When we land, it goes right in the hangar. The men were testing one of the most important weapons of the Cold War, the U-2 spy plane. There was no trainer. There was no two-seater. There was no simulator. The U-2 was armed with high-resolution cameras designed to fly at 70,000 feet and take photographs from the edge of the stratosphere. As the Cold War arms race with the Soviet Union intensified, the U-2 was America's best hope for tracking their rival's growing nuclear arsenal. And it put enormous demands on pilots who had to breathe pure oxygen to survive at such heights. Every extra ounce, even wheels, could limit the U-2's ability to fly high. You got all your fuel in the wing. There's no way you're gonna keep that tip off the ground. So they were only there to keep the wings off the ground. And as soon as the wings lifted up, those would drop out. I used to like to take off, just spiral right up straight. <laughs> the government's cover story for the U-2 was that it was being used for weather research. That was our cover story, yeah, reconnaissance weather squadron. Not conventional aircraft then, what did they see? The U-2 cruised at three times the height of regular airliners and would sometimes be glimpsed by civilians. If I can't be sure, but I believe I saw the sun glinting off of windows or observation portals of sort. In the mid-1950s, while both the Cold War and America's interest in UFOs were at their peak... I think it was from outer space, but friendly. The silver-colored plane sometimes created confusion. It was pure aluminum, and we said, hey, we look like a bright star up there. Pilots were told to deny everything, even to aircraft controllers. There are stories about seeing something flying way above. They may have called it in, but they'll still get nothing other than uh, evasive stuff. If you get up along the Canadian border, the ground controller wanted to question my altitude. Actually, he was pretty accurate. And I says, no, you got to recalibrate your weapon. <laughs> That's not the altitude we're at. By 1957, unacknowledged U-2 flights were the source of half of all reported UFO sightings. But they were nothing compared to what would come. Area 51 was established in one of the most isolated regions of the country. And in the early days, all outside access came through the desk of security agent Richard Minkus. All calls came in to Area 51, to that desk. That was the only number in and out of Area 51. I would answer the phone, and I'm not going to give you the correct number here. It's 656, uh, Inspector Mingus. That's it. If they asked me if Charlie Jones works there, I don't know. It was a really touchy thing, but I would never confirm nor deny a name over that phone. Nor would I give my location or give any idea as to what we're doing out there referring it to an air base or anything of that nature. Area 51 was so remote, most workers commuted weekly from Burbank or Las Vegas. Usually, you know, the family was asleep when I got up. On Monday morning, you'd get up and drive, for, and you got there early enough to get the airplane, you know, and it usually left about 8 o'clock. 
We never even knew how we were going to get out there. We often joke, one week they're flying with bombs, the next week they're flying with chickens. You never knew what was in the cargo bay of that plane that you were hitching a ride on. When you got off the Lockheed Constellation, uh, you went through security and they checked you had to have your badge and uh, make sure that you're the right guy coming in, and they did that routinely. They had very, very good security. Jim Friedman commuted daily. I had three children, and the typical, what does your dad do at school, I told them, I repair televisions. And my wife, she was so busy raising the children and getting them ready for school that she really wasn't that interested because she knew I played around with television a lot. He was fine. We had a good life. Even though sometimes he didn't come home for maybe a week, but he called, you know, and I said that he had to work overtime. <laughs> the kids, <laughs> especially my daughter, she says, where's daddy? He had to work overtime. Oh, <laughs> so I didn't know what he did. It's a strange, daily routine. You go home at night, the wife says, how did your day go today? And you're noncommittal. It wasn't bad. I got a few TVs fixed. I mean, no one is going to say, oh, honey, we just got the radar cross-section of the most secret aircraft in the world down to a Nats behind, yeah, right, <laughs> sure, now what did you do today? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you can't even talk about it. Let us face, without panic, the reality of our times, the fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. This insistence on total secrecy was fueled by Cold War paranoia and the widespread fear that the Soviet Union might destroy the United States. Each side was uh, suspicious of the other, and they were afraid they were going to be wiped out by a nuclear first strike. No one was trusted, not even the test pilots at Area 51. In 1963, Ken Collins crashed his plane on a training mission. Probably a week later, they said, well, okay, would you uh, agree to be hypnotized so we can establish whether or not you may have forgotten something? And I said, absolutely. So they got this, my term, high-powered shrink from Boston come out. But he couldn't hypnotize me. It just sort of sit there like, you know, he was talking to me like you were, and I thought, I'm just still just as like I'm always been, and then he just couldn't do it. It just didn't happen. A few days later, uh, Lockheed's flight surgeon called me up and he says, well, would you agree to have uh, sodium pentothal? And I says, uh, yeah. I said, I'd be happy to do that. I told my wife, I said, well, I'm going down to Lockheed. I have to go to work. She said, this Sunday, you never go to work on Sunday. And I said, well, this is special. And she said, OK. About 6 o'clock that night, these guys bring me home. Well, I'm still under the influence of the sodium pentothal. And they pour me in the chair in the living room and said goodbye and walked out. And that's all they said. My wife, they didn't say a word to her. <laughs> said, your car's here, gives the keys. And she was sort of irritated because she thought I was out drinking with the guys. But all in all, at the end of it, it established that what I said was everything that I'd told them was uh, factual. When such a bomb bursts at or near the ground, tens of thousands of tons... The government raced to develop ever more powerful weapons, and it chose to put its secret base, Area 51, alongside its nuclear testing grounds. Put on your guns. It was smack dab in the middle of the... Uh, nuclear test facility area up in Nevada. 
and nobody was anxious to go out there. And I think that privacy was very important to getting the job done and, and doing so in a good deal of, of secrecy. But with more than 450 nuclear explosions taking place between 1955 and 1968, the location had its drawbacks. When they were firing nuclear explosions there, of course, we're always notified and we have to evacuate. One time, it took almost two weeks because of, of weather, mostly winds and all that being wrong. And we had to wear radiation badges to make sure <laughs> we were still clean. I was standing out on the runway for some reason, and there was a blast coming off in uh, Yucca Flats. And I actually saw a wave pattern in the ground coming towards me. It actually went up and down, up and down. And this was an underground explosion. It's just unbelievable that these big circles would actually drop down on the ground. Driven by Cold War pressures, the U.S. worried that Area 51's founding project, the U-2, was already becoming vulnerable to Soviet missiles. The plan was to have a manned aircraft successor to the U-2 with far less vulnerability and with greater capability. Very few people at the agency, at CIA, know about it. In the late 1950s, Area 51 had a new top secret project. I started in 1958 working on what was called an uh, ox cart. About 1960, I was uh, notified that I had been selected for a some kind of astronaut program. It was an aircraft that we proposed to the CIA that would fly at very high altitudes, about 17 miles up. The original intent was to make it go as fast and as high as we could make it, and as difficult for radars to detect as possible. We were going so fast. If you're in, in California, if you're flying north-south, and, and you're making a turn at speed, at altitude, you won't stay in the state of California. It was that fast that just brought you out. In the Cold War, information was as powerful as weapons. The ox cart was designed to be America's ultimate spy tool, the world's first stealth plane. It flew fast and high enough to outrun missiles. Thousands labored on the plane inside Lockheed's facility in Burbank, California. But despite the scale of production, the project remained secret. The ox cart clearance was specialty clearance of its own, and it was about as high as you could get. The aircraft had to have the ability to withstand temperatures caused by air friction flying through the atmosphere at 2,000 miles an hour. The ox cart, 93% was titanium, a material that no one had ever made an airplane of. If you want a lot of titanium, you should make a deal with the Soviet Union. How the CIA got that stuff out of Russia, as far as I know, is still secret today. I don't know how they did it. I don't know who did it. But we did get the titanium material that we needed. When the ox cart prototype was ready, the government needed to move it to Area 51 from its production line in California. If it was round, they would put it in a square box. <laughs> If it was square, they'd put it in a round box. It was too long, and the wings were too broad, so the sections were separated and hauled all the way from Burbank to the Groom Lake side. You don't want a wide trailer going down a busy highway. So you would do this 
surreptitiously when no one's around. It required cooperation from California Highway Patrol and Nevada Highway Patrol, the CIA, and I have no idea how many others. The path up there had to be cleared. They had to cut trees away, regrade the dirt on the sides of the freeway or so that they could clear the boxes. They didn't have to know what was in the boxes, but they had to know it was something that had to be protected and uh, kept secret. So it was a rather enormous operation just to get them up there to the Groom Lake facility. Ken Collins was one of the first pilots to see the ox cart after it arrived at Area 51. I went up to the area, the operations officer up there said, would you like to see what you're gonna fly? I said, absolutely. And we walked over to the hangar and windows up top were just the only place that emitted any light. You can see back in the shadows this long, beautiful airplane. Just amazing. First thing you'd think is a spaceship. Inside Area 51, nearly 2,000 workers had a single goal, to complete the ultimate black project. There's a lot of things that people really don't need to know. And this is why Area 51 is such a mythical situation, because they don't know what's going on. Area 51 just had one purpose, and that was to, to get Oxcart through development and into operation overseas. Much about Oxcart has been classified for decades. More is known about its successor, the iconic SR-71 Blackbird. But today, glimpses of Oxcart are finally coming to light. Oxcart was the world's first stealth plane, designed to be nearly impossible for enemies to detect on radar. The test that I was involved in involved an Oxcart flying over that radar station. And the basic idea was to find out if they could fly over without being detected. I went into the radar control building to watch what would happen when the thing went over. Well, I was standing there and Nobody could see much happening. All of a sudden, it sounded like a ladder or something fell over on the roof. What it was was a shock wave from the airplane. They had not seen it on the radars. It certainly seemed like it was doing its job. The ox cart could fly coast to coast in 70 minutes, but its sole purpose was to spy. These images, taken over North Korea, were released by the CIA and have never been seen publicly. They reveal how well the ox cart could photograph objects on the ground from 90,000 feet while traveling 2,200 miles an hour. This camera was going in an airplane that was going to be going at Mach 3. The resolution was 12 inches, that's one foot. If you think about an object on the ground, and, and put a grid on it uh, with 12 inch squares, a little bit like linoleum squares. And each one of those squares is either black or white or gray. An object that was 12 inches on a side could be clearly identified as an object, although you couldn't tell what its internal structure was. But if you're taking a picture of a tank, you probably get, you know, 500 dots, and that pretty well defines the tank. But at the height of the Cold War, the men at Area 51 weren't the only ones with powerful cameras. The Russians had anywhere from four to six what we called ash cans. We had a satellite tracking set up and we were alerted to the time when the satellite was supposed to pass over. 
So as they were approaching our area, we would shut everything down. We had the hoot screwed sheds, we called them. And if a plane happened to be out in the open while the satellite was coming over the horizon, they would screw it into that, that building. But workers sometimes needed to leave a model of the ox cart on a pylon so they could test its stealth properties. And with the Soviets spying from above, this presented a problem. If you had a plane up on a pylon, it was pretty hard to disguise it from satellites. There were people in the security department that felt that we couldn't let them have a peek. So we had no way of handling the situation but taking the mock-up down off of the pole, putting it away in a hangar, and then taking it back out and putting it back up. That made the job very difficult, very difficult. To start working on the aircraft and then have to run it back into the hangar. And then pull it out, and then put it in, and then pull it out. It gets to be quite a hassle. Despite efforts to hide the secret aircraft, intelligence agents discovered that the Soviet Union had a drawing of the plane and had found a way to detect Oxcart. Most of the testing that we did in the daylight, radiation from the sun would heat up everything except the shadow. If we left the mock-up stationary for a half an hour or so, it might leave a shadow that an infrared camera could pick up. Soon, the men at Area 51 were intentionally devising fakes for the Soviets to discover. We used the infrared satellites for coming over and we would draw the outline of some kind of exotic plane in front of one of the hangars. Most of them was out of cardboard. Just before the satellite got there, we'd have a couple of heaters in the rear end of it to make it receive a heat signature as though the plane had just landed. We always wanted them to think we had something that they didn't. And they would surely spend a lot of time and money to try to figure out what it was. In Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen. Deceptions designed to protect Oxcart fueled the rumors about Area 51. Air Force jet fighters spend several hours chasing the objects plotted on the radar scope. We flew 2,850 missions out of Groom Lake, Area 51, that no one knew about. The plane did not exist. And naturally, the sunlight just right it would be spotted, and it would become a genuine UFO sighting. General Sanford, Air Force Intelligence Director, confirms that the objects are not secret American weapons and reiterates the Air Force's obligation to investigate. This is during the era that the Air Force was doing Project Blue Book, investigating UFO sightings. They started investigating, and all of a sudden, they'd run up there against this wall of security. They said, whoa, that's a top secret mission. You got to make a cover story and forget it happened. We have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports. So Project Blue Book, the poor guys, they would have to manufacture a story to explain that sighting. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. Air traffic controllers at the FAA had to be cautioned not to report something moving that fast in American airspace for fear of alarming people. The airline pilots were a big troublemaker. They would see the that blackbird climbing. They'd be at 80,000 feet, and the airlines were at 45. And they would call down and, and say, you know, they'd be yelling over the air. <laughs> but they'd see them. And the passengers would see them. The FBI would meet them at whatever airport they were landing at. And they just make them sign an inadvertent exposure that they wouldn't reveal what they had just seen. But when things went disastrously wrong at Area 51, the cover-up machine went into high gear. Despite the secrecy surrounding the ox cart, clues from an early mishap are finally coming to light decades later. It was low altitude subsonic uh, engine test. 
we had problems with getting the engine to accelerate out to Mach 3. We flew north out of the area and uh, got up to 25,000 feet, headed south, and we started getting into the weather. Something just wasn't feeling right. I was losing airspeed, but it wasn't indicated. Pretty soon, the airplane pitched up, went up, got inverted, and went into a flat, insipid spin. You just can't recover. So I thought I better eject. So I ejected down, because I was upside down. Ken made the right decision and punched out. What I my mind over then was I hate like hell to you know, have to bail out of that good airplane. He landed somewhere out near Wendover, Utah. I landed and collapsed the chute. I figured I was going to need that because I was going to probably be out there overnight and for survival, and I would use that to sleep in. My checklist had come apart, and I was starting looking, picking up some of the pages that are all classified, the stamp secret. The papers that I had picked up, I just stuck in my pocket, I guess. When a pickup truck come bouncing over across the desert, the three guys were in the truck. Well, I was amazed to see them. They said, uh, hey, come on, get in there. We'll take you over to your airplane. And I said, no, that's an F-105, and that was our story that we had. I said, it's got a nuclear weapon on board. They said, you better get in here. We're leaving. We're not going to stay. <laughs> so I jumped in front with them in the, in the front. There were four of us in the cab. I don't know where they thought they were going to go. If a, a bomb went off, you know, it's probably close enough. It wouldn't have made any difference. After Collins' admonition, after his <coughs> white lie, I don't think they were very anxious to go take a hard look at it. We did have a phone number that we called, you know, emergency kind of thing, and I made a 10 cent call. You know, identified myself, and that was that's all they needed to know, and I told them where I was. That gave the agency about two days to go out and scrape up the pieces and clean up the mess. Otherwise, it might have been a county fair. This is the first time photos of the government's effort to sanitize the crash scene have been revealed. They had two of our survival guys that were part of the security team, and later on they got on two horseback and they'd go back and forth and sort of plowshare to see if they got anything that was left laying there that was classified. Between the cover story and the remote location, the cleanup was good enough to keep the crash site secret for decades. It was described as having been an F-105 crash. You know, planes crash all the time around military bases, and it went away. Fifty years later, aerospace historian Peter Merlin has found the crash site the government tried to erase from history. Now we're getting into the real debris field. As part of the effort to sanitize the crash site, the larger pieces were cut up with a blowtorch and flown to Area 51 in a big cargo plant. He searched the desert for years using information from declassified documents. The secret memorandum was declassified by the CIA. It says all traces of 123 have been removed from the crash scene. My experience with crash sites, however, is that there's always something left. This piece here is part of the wing structure. The A was for the A-12, W for wing, and 667 was the drawing number. So this one's from the interior of the cockpit, Skunk Works inspection stamp. This is the impact crater. There's titanium all over the place. Whoa, here's a big, big chunk. 
This is some thick titanium. Right here is where the aft fuselage struck the ground. On either side, you'll find a depression from the engine nacelles. There's one right here. I'm standing in the middle of an engine nacelle depression. This would be similar to what would happen today if a secret aircraft from Area 51 were to be lost off range. They would probably implement the same kind of security restrictions. They would also use a cover story. McCarran Airport, Las Vegas, present day. A private hangar for unmarked jets. Every weekday, workers continue to make the same commute to Area 51 that's taken place since the days of the U-2 and Oxcart. These early programs changed Area 51 into a permanent home for America's black projects. But you go back and look at all the records, there's never been a flight at Groom Lake. Nothing that was as it seems. And the mystery continues today. The annual black military budget is more than $50 billion, the highest level in history. But even those who once sacrificed so much for Area 51 are no longer in on the secrets. I wish I knew what they were doing, but I, I don't know. I've even heard that Area 51 is a cover story for a much more secret area. I don't know, I can't confirm that either. I have no idea. I wish I knew. The secrecy and cover-ups continue to fuel rumors. There are a lot of situations people cannot know that they're not true. So I think that there's been an awful lot of misinformation, but it's been fed by people's natural curiosity. If you don't know what's going on, you might like to find out. Often, even the wildest speculation contains threads of truth. They have all these underground chambers uh, they claim we've got out there and tunnels that reach all the way to Las Vegas. And this is, you know, absolutely nothing like that. At the nuclear test stand, we did go underground because above ground, it was radioactive. But nothing, nothing at the area. And another the myth has been in, in recent years that we have gained all this speed and technology out of the uh, reverse engineering alien craft. This is the true story. We did reverse engineer things out there. It was a Russian MiG-21. And we got it in 1968, and we tore it apart, see how the Russians built it, and then put it back together, and we flew it. Even the conspiracy theory that the government staged the moon landing at Area 51 has a slight basis in fact. It's on the atomic testing grounds. We tested our Land Rover that we sent to the moon. We tested all of the life support systems. The astronauts came out here and trained in the atomic bomb craters. So that's probably where some of those crazy stories come from. I think when people signed on to Oxcart or U2, they agreed that it might never be revealed. And so people said, hey, look, it's uh, kind of a family secret. We're happy to go to the grave with it. It was an honor, very much an honor, to have a job with that much trust put in me as a, you might say, a country boy. A, a lot of trust was, was put on people like me that worked out there. A lot of people dedicated their lives. Some families broke up because they never knew what their husbands, if their husbands were going to come home at night. It wasn't just a job. We are given some task to accomplish, 
and we believed in it, and we did the best we could. I'm just glad it turned out the way it did. But when it comes to what went on at Area 51, the only thing we know for sure is that we'll never know everything. I'm telling you about 5% of what went on. I've only told you part of the story, seriously. I have to be honest. <laughs>